Hello and welcome to today's ACM 6 of webinar. This webcast is part of the ACM 6 of commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM 6 of webinar series features speakers from the future of software engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as uh, select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I am Pekka Abrahamson, Professor of Software Engineering at the University of Jyväskylä in Finland. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, you today. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slide will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. Now, if you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press F5 key in Windows, Command plus R on a Mac, or refresh your browser on mobile devices. Or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them into QA box at any time during the webinar and click the submit button. At the end of the presentation, we will have time to respond to the questions. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Today's presentation is uh, uh, 50 years of software engineering, so now what? Uh, by Ivar Jakobson. Ivar Jakobson received his PhD in computer science from KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Ivar has authored 10 books, and he is a father of components and components architecture, work that was adopted by Ericsson Telecommunications Company and resulted in the greatest commercial success story ever in the history of Sweden. He is also the father of the notion of use cases and uh, one of the three original developers of the unified modeling language. But all this is history. Ivar founded his current company, Ivar Jakobsen International, which uh, since 2004 has been focused on using methods and tools in a smart, super light and agile way. This work resulted in uh, that Ivar became a founder and a leader of the worldwide network CMAT, which has the mission to revolutionize software development based on a kernel of software engineering. I have personally known Ivar for more than 10 years, and I've actively supported the CMAT initiative since its first days. It is truly an honor to be here to, to, together with Ivar today. Ivar, without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I am truly um, excited about uh, being able to talk about this uh, work that I have um, uh, basically worked with since 2003. Um, it has been my major um, uh, task uh, uh, project since uh, at least 2009. And um, so I am, of course, very uh, excited to tell you about it. The 50 years of software engineering comes from uh, 1968, uh, just about 50 years ago. We um, uh, the most prominent uh, software developers in the world, in, particularly in the academic world, had identified the so-called software crisis. And they met in, uh, outside Munich in Germany and spent basically a week to come up to, to how we're going to address it. And that is when the term software engineering was coined and um, it became popularized. So where are we in this uh, software engineering? Before I get into that, I would like to mention some problems with dealing with methods and practices. Uh, this is a client, um, a actual telecom vendor, who gave me a list of problems that they were interested in addressing. <clears throat> and uh, uh, you can see here uh, examples. Uh, I cannot go through all of them, 
but uh, poor code poor code quality uh, too much craft too little engineering uh, the latter was that they felt that uh, uh, they were too dependent on individuals and too little on um, engineering uh, we always depend on engineering uh, um, uh, our engineers but um, or our developers uh, but um, uh, it could be more of engineering, more of systematic uh, uh, development. They also had examples of how do we train, uh, select and train software personnel? How do we grow the, their skills? Um, and uh, number 11 here, how can AI support development? So all of these uh, um, problems we addressed and discussed, and um, uh, we uh, could describe to them how they could improve each and every one by using uh, essence, which I'm going to talk about next. So, um, if you look upon software engineering over the years, <clears throat> go back to basically its origin. And uh, when we started to develop software, originally we used assembler programming language. There was basically no engineering. It was just uh, 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 the best people did the best job. But then in the 70s, we got uh, uh, many methodologies, hundreds, that were related to uh, something like structure analysis and design. And um, uh, they basically all uh, uh, made models in terms of data models and um, function functional models. These were completely thrown out um, basically in the 80s when we got object-oriented analysis design and uh, <clears throat> component-based design development, unified process, UNIMAL. That was basically all thrown out. Now I exaggerate a little, but uh, when we got uh, to the end, uh, uh, end of the last uh, um, uh, decennium, we got Agile, and no, it's not 2000 Agile, and now it's all about Android scale. So we have these paradigm shifts that we basically throw out after every one of them, we throw out um, what we had before. So here, um, we uh, look at the ambition to engineer um, I'm saying ambition not success but ambition to engineer has gone up and down at the beginning we were had no ambition and uh, then we were uh, in the 70s when we got structural analysis method and then object methods uh, it was all about the uh, um, high ambition we were not very successful and that resulted, of course, in the backslash. And that was uh, when Agile came, and um, and um, uh, the uh, ambition was very low. Uh, it's now racing. So there is, uh, in the new approaches, there is uh, an interest to be doing more engineering. So where are we now, and where do we want to go? <clears throat> Software development is today more of a craft than an engineering discipline. Uh, that is something I hear uh, a lot, and that's my own observation. Uh, we need to change that. Uh, why? The reason is we want better software. We want higher value. It's um, uh, creating value to the client. Faster and cheaper, uh, of course. Uh, how? Uh, we there are basically a couple of ways. Uh, one is raising the competence level of people and uh, make sure they are on a path for learning forever. And of course, moving from craft to engineering, uh, meaning more structure, more uh, removing um, work that uh, is um, no brain work and uh, let the, the developers, the, our people, to focus on uh, what really needs creativity. 
and not reinventing the wheel. <clears throat> so uh, that is an assessment. Um, we think uh, the answer, uh, an answer at least, is uh, essence. And that is uh, what we have been working on for all these years. So what is essence? Well, it actually has become a standard, a common ground. Uh, it's adopted by Object Management Group as a standard. It was done in 2014. It took us uh, many years to get that we, to place where we had something that could be described as common ground for all these methods. Thousands of methods that we have, have been published have been published um, out there. Well, when you have a word standard, you always wonder, is this, uh, is this good? A standard is only good if it's, uh, uh, if there is uh, no objections to it, if it's something we don't need to think about, if it's something that is so obvious so we, we can adopt it without any problems. So uh, I, I have been involved in, in several standardization work, and uh, uh, in this case, we were extremely ca cautious about not adding anything that could be controversial. So um, um, we, we adopted a very conservative approach. Essence can be seen from two different perspectives. So first of all, it's not a method. It's a, a platform to describe methods. Um, the tech, on the technical side, it helps to guide teams uh, with a modern user experience. We use poker size, size cards. Um, it focuses on what is essential. Not everything is important. When you read a book, um, very little of what is in the book is, uh, for instance, my books uh, on software engineering or whatever. When I look backwards, I look at what I wrote, um, at that point of time, I was very happy for every page uh, more I could put in the book. But um, I didn't consider, as I should have done, uh, the, uh, the reader. Instead, uh, uh, by focus on the essentials, it makes the practices easy to learn and easy to apply in the daily work. It has two components for technical side. There is a language, a very small language, I'll talk about that next. And there is a kernel, a kernel of things that we uh, don't need to, we always uh, have, always work with, always uh, must uh, consider when we develop software. But then the very interesting thing is it's also, uh, there is also a human side to it. Uh, it. It is not just a technical thing, it's a thinking framework that stimulates people to have conversations about important things within a team and between teams. It has numerous placeholders for conversation with proposals for questions to be asked and space for asking more questions. And Software development is enhanced by a set of serious interactive games. So um, these two things, technical and human, are different views of the same thing. Um, and we need both. Uh, software development is a human activity, um, but we also need technical uh, contributions here. So we uh, develop with uh, uh, high quality, we develop what the clients really need, and so on. I'll give you an example now. Scrum. And we have worked with Jeff Sutherland, who is one of the co-founders of, um, co-creators of Scrum. And uh, uh, we, he has now adopted um, uh, something we call Scrum Essentials. Namely, Scrum is described as a set of cards. For instance, there are cards for things to do. And you see there is a little symbol there to up to the left on every card. Uh, it's a, an activity. And the activity is described on a card. Of course, there is much more to be said about these activities, but this is the essence. And um, this is the beginning that someone should learn first. 
so they can participate in working in, in teams. Uh, things to work with. Uh, there are things that we really need to monitor. For instance, a sprint, uh, the, a product backlog item, improvement. They go through states. They are uh, states uh, where you, from the beginning, uh, you uh, have um, uh, just started the sprint, and then there is another state, and so on, till you have actually finished the sprint. So these are very important elements. Uh, we call them alphas, and that is a term uh, because um, we wanted, first of all, they have never existed in the literature before we um, uh, started this work. But we felt we needed something to measure progress and health. Uh, these alphas are evidenced by work products. So there is uh, here five work products. One is uh, definition done. Uh, a sprint backlog, product backlog, and so on. So there are two different things uh, we deal with. The alphas have got a name because they are like this, they are the most key elements in the software development endeavor. They are uh, like the um, alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Alpha, we talk about alpha stars. Uh, we talk about alpha animals. So that is the association. These are the things we need to really monitor and progress. Uh, and here we show how we play games with these cards. Uh, this is um, a particular game called, um, um, I think it's, Contract breach. No, I, I cannot tell you for sure it is. It's the game we played, and it's people that are playing it. We are now having um, a huge number of games um, uh, to be played in different situations. They are serious. They stimulate people to collaborate. Um, I will talk more about these games soon. I will actually show a game, how you play a very uh, interesting game. So look now at the technical aspects of it. Essence <clears throat> are two things. A language, which is very simple. It's visual. Um, don't think about Merl or any other modeling language. This is so simple, so you can learn it in just a few hours. Uh, it's very intuitive. That has been the objective. Then we have a kernel that includes things to essential things to work with when you develop software or when you, yeah, even other aspects, but uh, when you develop things. Uh, essential things to do and the essential competences you need. That's part of the kernel. And, and we call that essence, which is then a common ground adopted by object management group. It was a huge task to get it through a standard process. It took four or five years, has been scrutinized by hundreds of people. And uh, before we went to OMG with it, we had uh, uh, 30 people working on it uh, in an international community um, for a couple of years. So it's... Uh, uh, has been, and we had a conservative approach for what we would say can be standardized. So, just a quick look at the language. This is the notation for practice. Uh, a practice is like a, a mini method. It's something, for instance, user story is a good practice, uh, Scrum is a good practice. Um, um, continuous integration, um, component-based development, architecture, and so on, are a good example of practices. Uh, we uh, describe a practice with a number of elements. We have activities, uh, uh, things to do. We have two things we work with, namely the alphas, and the work product. The activity progress the alphas from state to state. 
the uh, activity produce uh, work products which describe the alphas. So uh, alphas are not tangible. You know you have it. For instance, uh, um, you have a, I'll give you a couple of examples soon, but um, uh, for instance, requirements uh, is an alpha, but the requirement specification would be a work product. You have to, you don't need to have a documentation and still the alpha can, can uh, be progressed um, because you have tacit knowledge. And competency, we, to do a job, you need a competency. And you can have many different levels of competency. Um, so, uh, a, for instance, a developer is a competency. You can have, uh, when you just start working, you are, have a lowest competency. And when you are, have been working and, and very, very competent, you have the highest. And the, usually that is what people think are architects. We also have some generic mechanisms for describing other elements and how they uh, they are related to one another, and that is the pattern. So patterns are very useful constructs. This is all there is in the language, basically. So let me just, uh, uh, I hope you can stay with me a little bit more. I, I will soon finish this um, uh, feeding of uh, technical stuff. Uh, but uh, it is new but, and it's very important, um, so I have to go through it and then I'll show you how to use all this stuff in a more practical way. So the essence kernel has seven alphas. You see these, uh, these are these um, uh, uh, fishes or what, uh, whatever they look like. It's uh, alpha symbols, uh, all of them, the alpha Greek letter. And we have three different areas where these, uh, uh, our, all our elements uh, are located. In the customer area, we have two alphas. We have stakeholders. Stakeholders are people who really care about the product and uh, have to be involved. Usually, in many, many projects around out there, they fail because we don't get the stakeholders, the client or the product owner and so on, involved in the work. A opportunity, there is always an opportunity while you do a job. Usually the opportunity is described by a business case uh, or, 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 yeah, if it is described. We have a solution error. That is what really stays after you have run a project. And, and you have, in this case, a software system and you have uh, requirements. They are different alphas that you progress differently. And uh, then the endeavor area, which has to do with the actual endeavor of a project, where you have team, uh, work, and where you're working. All these th things have to be progressed. For instance, at the beginning, you may only have seeded a team. And then you have identified the team members. But they are not collaborating. They have not, never worked together before. So that's another state where you get to collaborating, etc. And the similar thing with where you're working, how you're going to do the job. When you start, you may not have any clear uh, picture of what you're going to do, but you may have some principles you want to achieve. And then eventually you identify which practice are you going to adopt and, and so you go through states of these two and so on. And work finally is the things you uh, uh, kick off, pieces of work you do. So, um, and, and then these alphas have states. So you see here two uh, uh, alphas, opportunity and software system. These uh, are represented by poker size cards. And you go uh, from the state, go from the top to the bottom. For instance, software system, the first uh, state you would like to achieve is that you have an architecture selected. You know what the structure will be and then you can demonstrate, etc. Apart from the, um, uh, the uh, alphas, which you have to write here, things to work with, you have activity spaces and we have competences. Uh, I don't have time to go through these, but they are part of the kernel. 
But I think uh, you get the idea by just thinking about the, the um, alphas. So now, um, let's look at the human aspect. In, in the, the picture here is, um, um, is actually taken from work that Pekka did in, uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, um, that shows basically uh, the result in form of a radar diagram. You progress, um, so every, every dimension here uh, uh, is an alpha. And uh, on the alpha axis, you have a state. And you can see how uh, you progress at a particular, so after every iteration, for instance, you identify in which state each alpha is. And then you get a diagram like that. Each move means that the, each, uh, for instance, a sprint, means that uh, you, you, you move in a wave over several alpha from one set of states to another. Um, here is an, a, a picture a little later, uh, a later iteration in the project. And you see you have moved the radar diagram and you can, uh, you, you, you are now, and you have to move basically each dimension um, at the same time. You cannot just do, for instance, what uh, many projects fail. They, they just focus on the software system and don't um, pay enough attention about the opportunity or the stakeholders. And, and then uh, it's high risk of failure because you may build a product that no one really wants. In every state change, now look at the right of the picture is a placeholder for compensation. You have this card, and the card says, has a number of checks. In the team, you discuss uh, these checks and agree on uh, if, it's, uh, if you have passed it or not. These checks are not the, uh, all the things you have to talk about, but they are valuable in that they help you to trigger a conversation in the team. We have seen people who earlier never really discussed, uh, just did the job, be uh, very active in discussions and uh, agreeing on what, are, uh, what do we need to do to achieve this check. So that is really about how to get stimulate the team to work together. So here you see, uh, for instance, the opportunity, alpha. It has six uh, states, and uh, each state have a number of checks uh, that you have to progress to pass uh, the state uh, represented by the card. So here is some new ideas, uh, in essence. First. Um, we, uh, I mean, I've written uh, uh, several books. I uh, have um, not, uh, and, and they have been selling uh, fantastic. People buy the books, uh, over one million copies. Uh, people buy the books, they don't read them. The good news is that I have to travel and talk about them. Uh, but, um, uh, so, so books is not a really good, uh, a way of getting uh, people to adopt ideas. Uh, instead, using a new user experience like cards has been has shown to be very effective. Um, and the separation of the essentials from the non-essentials results that you, in a, in a lightweight process that's both agile and di uh, disciplined. Um, it doesn't mean that books are useless, but books are more complementary material than the essential material to teach. We, we, um, we have also the common ground uh, that is um, uh, used for, to describe practices and uh, uh, when, when you work. And finally, 
methods or compositions or practices. It's um, a, a, which, which allow you to compose your own method from a library practice. So you imagine you have a library practice. You pick the practice you want to have, and in that way you create a method. Uh, we get out of what I have called the method prison, um, namely where uh, if you are adopt if you have adopted one method, you have a very hard time to add practices from another method. So uh, today, safe is extremely popular, uh, but everything that is in safe has to be uh, adapted to the safe way of describing the, uh, describing practices. You cannot easily take practices from any of the other uh, popular frameworks. So here you have, a, a, for example, a, a schematic picture showing that the, you have, this is a method. At the bottom you have essence, and then you have a practices on top of essence. Um, essence makes methods modular, not monolithic. Every method otherwise out there is monolithic. It cannot be, even if it has uh, uh, modules in itself, you cannot take easily things from other methods and just uh, just take it and grab it and use it. You have to usually um, adapt it to the, the method you, you want to use. So imagine here now you have um, you have a, a, a practice library or an ecosystem. Uh, you have freed the practice from their method because you have, for instance, uh, safe is uh, to the right here is a set of practices. Discipline agile delivery is a set of practice. Nexus is a set, set of practice, and you have your own existing practice. You have a library of practice like that. They are all described using essence. Now you can. What you can do now is you can select the practice you like, and you can uh, ignore the ones you don't need, and then you have your own method, and. Uh, they can be composed. There is some effort you have to do to compose them, but it's significantly lower than uh, traditional. And you, you can, uh, as practice, it become better if you, uh, if someone work with a practice and find it better, it improves. It will become improved, and you get access to improvement that happens in the realm of. Um, uh, where the practice is used. So now uh, you have now we have had a little theory talk, and now I will get more into showing uh, the practicalities of using it. So um, I will um, I will now. Um, move to next slide, uh, which is, so essence have impact on so many roles. That is one of the reasons it's hard to, to get the whole picture. It's uh, not only good for, for, um, for executives and teams, it's good for individual practitioner, it's good for academics, it's good for method experts. Uh, there are so many, many more uh, that uh, we have had to consider. Uh, I will focus now on two of them, namely the executives of it and the teams. Uh, the executives get more automation um, and can have more things automated uh, thanks to the strict structure and rigor of a practices and the uh, using essence. And uh, practice and methods are, uh, if they are designed the way uh, using essence, which is very easy. It's uh, think significantly easier to describe a practice using essence than what we traditionally did. It's AI ready, uh, ready for, for being supported by uh, expert system like uh, techniques. And teams get the common ground for conversations. 
they can easily learn new things because we have a common ground. They can learn, they can also easily adopt new things coming and they can change what they have adopted um, significantly easier than in the past. But maybe most important is that they get support in their daily work. It's not just a method description. They get these cards that they play games with that will help them in their daily work. So just, uh, um, I, I will not go through all the others, but I'll tell you uh, the values that these, get, these uh, two um, um, personas get. We, uh, thanks to that you continuously can improve your knowledge. Uh, if you work with one practice, you get access to improvement of that practice. You don't really need to throw away anything. Uh, uh, you can replace something, but you don't need to throw away complete methodologies that we have done in the past. So you continuously can raise the competence level of, of um, uh, practitioners. Uh, the executives, get to this um, closer to um, uh, engineering and move from craft to engineering. Both of them um, create the learning organizations uh, that can continuously improve. So uh, uh, by having practice library that is accessible to everybody in the company, you can uh, build your knowledge on on what is there and what and add more knowledge as that becomes available. Now I'll show you one particular game. Uh, and it's, um, it's uh, we call it Welcome to State Club. Um, to um, um, adhere to uh, uh, Site Club. And um, <clears throat> the game is called Chase the State. We build a health monitor. First, we lay out the cards. So we look at, uh, this is an alpha uh, stakeholder with its states. And uh, this is one of the seven alphas. Um, and there is a little, the card has a little bit description on it. We uh, have um, the uh, uh, alpha cards. So this is the third state for a um, uh, stakeholder recognized. Uh, there are a number of checks uh, listed. You cannot read it now because, uh, and actually for this little short uh, time I have, I have to give it to you uh, just to get the idea. To get to this state, there are a number of things we have suggested on the card that you discuss in the team. And uh, uh, there's another card uh, represented. So now you... Um, look at this and you add all the cards for the stakeholder and you take the next line that is uh, opportunity and here you have a whole deck of cards from the, uh, the alphas are to the left and the state cards are to the right and there is a slider so now I will give you uh, the idea of how this can be used the team can uh, can discuss within the team how far they have come. This is like a health monitor. So they can discuss where are we? And then they can see if uh, what we have done is, uh, is useful. They can also be used uh, if you have um, a pro project with um, say 10 teams working independently. Uh, so the <clears throat> The uh, project manager for the whole project can um, have a conversation with each team and uh, find out where they are in a way that is agnostic to any method. So the team can use any method. It's, uh, uh, the the um, uh, project manager doesn't need to have any idea about which method they use because the cards talk about uh, it's agnostic to how you work. So let's uh, look at this. Uh, so let's take the first um, uh, row up there, uh, the stakeholder, and you start to look at what is, first you look at the material you have, and um, you use that as a background for the discussion. 
And when <coughs> you take the first core, the stakeholder core, and um, you uh, move it, uh, and you look at the different points here, and you see that uh, uh, you, this is done. The stakeholder have uh, been in, identified. There is agreement, responsibilities of stakeholders um, uh, defined. So this is all done. So now you can move that core to the left, meaning it's done. We have passed that stage. You take the next core, you look at that in the same way, and you, in this case, you also say all these things are done. So now you can move that core to the left as well. So you take the third core. And, but here you find, no, this is not done, and this is not done, this is not done. So you cannot move a core. It stays where it is. So next line, that is opportunity. You uh, do similar things. Identify that you are in the second state is passed, but not the first state. You go for requirements. You go for software system. And you have a discussion in the team about these things. And, and uh, these, this, this, so basically every core is a placeholder of a conversation. It doesn't mean that um, uh, everyone would make the same judgment of where we are, but it is a um, useful uh, discussion to have in the team and, and to engage the team in, in where you are and so on. So now we have uh, made a statement, we are here, uh, we have not moved um, um, all, every, every, uh, every alpha has not progressed. And here we can now have a discussion, is this, um, is this a healthy state? Uh, have we, uh, shouldn't we have done more on requirement to really be here? So we know more about what is the product. How can we possibly have identified architecture, uh, uh, like in software system, without knowing more about the requirement, and so on. So this is a healthy discussion to have. And um, uh, once we have settled on where we are, we discuss what to do next. And um, we uh, uh, go to the right, look at the court to the right, and say, this is what we are going to do next. You take uh, one row after the other and identify uh, what uh, what should be the next sprint, for instance. And the cards in the middle here are, uh, represent the target. This is where we want to get next. So another discussion uh, that help you to get to uh, uh, the team have consensus. And it can also be a discussion with, um, uh, where you have the team talking to a project manager and agree on what to do next. So it uh, has showed be very helpful. I can tell you when I was in um, uh, I was in China uh, in October, and uh, <clears throat> I had um, uh, thirty uh, Scrum masters, and we discussed the Scrum, uh, and we showed them how Scrum. Would look like in in the in the shape of cards, and um, we talked for one or two hours. Um, very little interaction. Uh, in China, people don't talk um, until they are managers. Uh, well, they don't talk even. They let their managers talk when you present. At least that is very common. And uh, so we had some interaction. Manager stood up and said, uh, this sounds really great. Uh, we need to do this. But <clears throat> then um, I played this game with the team. And I can tell you we were having these 30 people standing around when I played this game. I identified one guy to be um, uh, the uh, project manager. And then uh, he talked to different teams and had this conversation. Everybody was engaged. So uh, it's, uh, it's hard to believe when you just see it. You have to actually play it. So now uh, <clears throat> I'd like to show you that we uh, have worked a lot by scaling it up. But I have to be very quick now. 
So uh, just to give you the feeling, um, we have developed and, and we have on our website uh, a set of practices which we call Agile Essentials. They are all described in this way. There are seven of them. You can go there and you can browse them and you can see what they work. Um, we are working right now on doing something uh, that uh, here you need to know uh, something about the essence to really appreciate it. But now we are working on a new portal that will make it very easy to get into the system and be understand it. We have developed uh, 10 practices that we call Agile at Scale. Uh, <clears throat> they are all practice uh, focusized cards. They are browsable, and you can uh, you can uh, get ideas and inspiration for your own sake. Uh, we have, of course, uh, the old uh, unified process is has been essentialized. You'll find uh, the new use case 2.0 there that uh, is uh, inc includes ideas from user stories, but also still keeps the big picture you get from use cases. We have microservices, work in progress, and DSDM is another method in Europe. This is a very interesting uh, practice. You see in the circle here, this is a beautiful picture because it uh, attempts to, to attract people, and it has attracted a lot. Um, we have here, uh, you see the practices in the outer circle, and and uh, they are all described using essence. This has resulted in, in um, enormous in interest in um, Sweden with uh, many new projects starting up to build more of this kind of stuff. It has nothing to do with software. It's about um, <clears throat> anything, you, anything related to innovation. Okay, so uh, now final, um, I'll get to the uh, wrap up now. Uh, we have um, uh, we are working in the industrial world as well as in in the academic world, uh, and um, in the industrial world now many companies around the world are adopting Essence uh, for their methods. Uh, they they have increased dramatically the last year because uh, there has been much more to to, to use. Here is uh, one example. It's a quote from Tata Consulting Services. Uh, which has more than 390,000 consultants. Uh, maybe it's just 390,000 employees. I, I really don't know, but it's a huge number of consultants. Uh, it says that more than 80% of TCS is focused <clears throat> on something uh, that has adopted essence as its de facto method creation standard. It's quite impressive, such a big company. And Jeff Sutherland, as I said, has a centralized SCUM and he uses it in, it in training when he gives SCUM training. In the academic world, <clears throat> Pekka wrote uh, a quote. There are many universities today using it, but Pekka wrote a quote a couple of years ago, and now it was last year. And I think um, uh, my software engineering education in the future will be driven by essence. Is um, is the end statement. And we have a new book out now. Uh, it will be published in a couple of months, uh, two, three months, by uh, a company close to ACM Press. It has been reviewed by more than 30 professors around the world, and we have made a lot of changes on the way, but <clears throat> not this, uh, essential, but making the, it more clear. So. Um, and finally, uh, essence is being generalized. Uh, there are now people working on creating a more general uh, kernel than essence that can be specialized for different areas, such as system engineering, service engineering, product engineering, business engineering, basically all kinds of engineering. So, and finally, it is futurized. Uh, since you have uh, codified practices, we are at the beginning of getting smart practices. So uh, they, they can be supported by AI. And given that so much of our work when we develop software is uh, following patterns, um, 
there is uh, in a huge amount of opportunities to make uh, software development um, uh, more creative, where we can focus on the creativity of our uh, developers and less doing no brain work. So it's a lot of um, uh, opportunity. So only the sky is the limit. So with that, I would say welcome to the future. We are going to have uh, uh, two more seminars like this, in uh, one in January and one late, in, I think it's late January. If I remember correctly, it's the 10th of January, but you can see that by looking at uh, uh, the website for for um, um, Sigsoft. And you can go to our website, you will find a lot about Essence there, uh, and uh, anybody is welcome to send me an email. And my email address is very easy, Ivor at IvorJacobson.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ivar, for the uh, for the presentation. Now let's go to the QA period. We have received many questions, and we have some uh, uh, minutes left, so I just uh, dive into the first question. Uh, and uh, it comes from Daniel, and he said, "Thank you, Ivar. Wonderful work as usual." So I have to ask, uh, what's to keep this uh, from being another fad? Yet one more way of doing things with the new terminology, etc only to be replaced by the latest in a few more years. So what is your reply? Yeah, that is a great question. And of course, a question I have been uh, asked many times. <clears throat> uh, and uh, the answer is simple, that uh, uh, there are things in... Uh, so first of all, it's not a new method. It's, uh, it's a platform uh, where you deal with methods. Uh, and it's uh, actually... Uh, you deal with methods in an agile way, easy to change, easy to adopt, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, what, so, so something, there is something we uh, always do, always have, always produce when we develop software. And if we identify that, and, it, and we are very conservative, we don't think about, uh, is this something that is uh, just popular now? but instead uh, identify things that really um, are at the heart of what we are doing. Um, and we uh, go through this process where people can tell us, uh, uh, hundreds of people have told us what, uh, what doesn't work, what is too much in this, and reduce it to a minimum. This uh, essence kernel is uh, um, really reduced to, well, maybe not a minimum, but close to minimum for software development. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Ivar. Yeah. Uh, I think that we are we're moving on to new questions uh, to uh, try to cover a few of them. Uh, here's quite uh, uh, interesting from Nanda Kumar. Uh, he is asking that through this approach, is it possible to know the current status of the completion throughout the development and is it possible to issue a quantitative quality score to the software? So, <clears throat> say that again. Is it possible to... To know the current status of the completion uh, throughout the development? Yes, I mean, there are many things involved here. First of all, the, these alphas are, are the most important um, alphas in the endeavor. When every practice will add new alphas that are specific for that practice. So uh, when you, uh, if you just follow uh, the essence and progress of essence, you will, um, you will not see much progress during a long time in the project. But these subalphas will help you to identify completion. And uh, it is the, uh, and, and we have evidence of that, that uh, you, um, you can identify uh, when you when you are done. Uh, we get a lot of help through these things to de describe definition of done. So I think the, the answer is yes, in simple words. Thank you. Yes, and now uh, we. Uh, this is very interesting. Amelia asked a few times that. Uh, since you haven't mentioned the unified modeling language anywhere in the presentation, that uh, 
Uh, so uh, will UML uh, be redundant in the future? What will happen to it? UML is a f big company uh, in, in telecommunication, in, uh, in a, a particular in technical areas, cannot live without something like UML. They need to have an architecture. They throw away a lot of money if we don't have a described architecture. But you don't work with architecture as we did in the uh, 20 years ago. You grow the architecture uh, in steps, and uh, you, you don't start with a big architectural effort uh, at the beginning. So UML is uh, definitely um, uh, a candidate for the future too. I don't see any, any issues of fundamental importance to essence. However, uh, I think um, it would have been a much easier language if it had been essentialized in a similar way as we do now. So the answer, uh, UML will, is part of it. Thank you. And now we move on to question uh, posed by Paul. How can a practice from a, a DAD, so which is a disciplined agile development, and a practice from a SAFE work together when you use essence? How you can put things together from uh, different sources? First of all, they are described using the same platform. And uh, using the essence as a platform is a, a very important glue to be able to put together practices from different areas. Uh, they are described using the same language. Today, these practices are described using very different ways of being presented. So it's uh, almost, um, it requires a big job to merge them and uh, cannot be done easily. But if we essentialize SAFE, and we have actually done it, we have essentialized SAFE 4.0, but we did it uh, only as a proof of concept. We are not selling it, we are not teaching anybody it, but we know it can be very well done. If we did that, it would be easy to merge that with other practices from, for instance, uh, uh, LESS or Nexus uh, or Scum at Scale, which is now getting uh, quite popular because they, are, they will, uh, Scum at Scale will be essentialized. All right, let's move on to, we have uh, still uh, a minute or so. So Ade Kuni asked a question about the, when you said about moving from craft to engineering, and uh, now that the software development today is uh, driven by innovation, uh, oh, oh, and the innovation came very late in your presentation. So what is the role between innovation and uh, essence? Innovation is, it's our life, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it is absolutely the future of humanity. We will innovate forever. The thing is that today developers have to spend too much of our time of doing things that don't need innovation. They re reinvent the, uh, the, the world. So uh, by freeing them from doing uh, things, uh, um, routine work, and instead focus on creativity, they get uh, uh, support. And that is what Essence does without AI and even more with the support of AI. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Ivar. And I think that our time is now concluded. So thank you so much for the presentation and answering the questions. Thank you very much, and hope to see you again in, uh, at the next uh, webinar, which I think is around January 10th.